Okay, now let's move on to the next speaker. Uh, the, uh, the next speaker is uh, Raymond Shark. Uh, Professor Shark, could you share your screen first? Why he's preparing his uh, talk? Uh, let me uh, introduce uh, the talk title. Uh, the talk title is uh, a designer's toolkit for constructing complex nanoparticle libraries. Mm -mm. Okay, thank you. Can you see it okay? Yeah, perfect. Excellent. All right. So, so yeah, thanks for the thanks for the invitation to to join remotely. Uh, for me, it's late at night, so I will do my best. I'm an early morning person. I'm I'm brightest in the morning, so this is approaching my, you know, wind down time. But I, I'm going to tell you a little bit today. It's going to be a very different talk and a very different topic than than Reg's. I know when we had our panel discussion, there were quite a few questions actually that came up about synthesis and making materials and making nanostructures and you know thinking about how far we are to, you know toward where chemists are in making organic molecules and how you start approaching materials by design and actually being able to synthesize them. So that's what I'll get into in in this talk. That's a lot of the work that my group has been focusing on. And so to start, though, I wanted to mention a ACS Nano recently, just a, I think it was, yeah, it was the September issue, late September, we put together a virtual issue on nanosynthetic chemistry. Jill and I worked together, Jill Millstone and I worked together along with some members of our groups. This was kind of a COVID shutdown project that we started last summer when the labs were down to give the, the students some, some cool you know, things to look into. And, and basically we came up with a collection of 31 papers. It was hard to narrow down to that. There were a lot more papers even than that, but just some really cool papers that stood out from just the last few years in ACS Nano that really speak to the frontier areas of nanosynthetic chemistry. And, and just as a, a highlight, you know, synthesis, you know, sorry, my, my laser pointer <laughs> got in the way of, being able to, to move things on the screen. Anyway, it, in, although synthesis underpins innovations in many areas, advances in synthesis itself can take fields in completely new and unexpected directions. And so that's true of all of the articles that are included in this special issue, as well as many others in, in ACS Nano, and that can include nanostructure growth mechanisms, understanding how nanostructures form and grow, 2D materials, 1D materials, 0D materials, patterning, and, and all sorts of control that is necessary as a prerequisite to realizing functions. And so the area that, that my group works on most extensively is inorganic nanoparticles. And so I'm putting here some, some graphics from some of the, not, not from my own group's work, but from some of the articles that were included in the nanosynthetic chemistry virtual issue. And I just want to visually highlight kind of where, you know, where we are as a field. There, there are material systems where we know a lot about how to precisely control the features that matter for properties, things like size and shape and aspect ratio. There's many more that we don't, right? Many more material systems and many more, you know, much more knowledge that we don't have. There's the ability to start probing it's not easy, but there's the ability to start probing how nanoparticles and nanostructures form and grow. There's increasing capabilities in, in maximization of some metric. Uh, it could be you know, a certain property, it could be a certain feature, it could integrate machine learning and computational prediction, but the field it is really, really poised to make you know kind of next level advances in synthesizing and 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 maximizing the 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 properties and, and structures and functions of inorganic nanoparticles. One of the things that that I've become really interested in in the last few years is kind of moving beyond what would be considered single component nanoparticles, nanoparticles that have driven the field for decades. Where, where you're focusing on a single material, perhaps as a quantum dot or a plasmonic metal. But these kind of next level nanoparticles are, are hierarchical in structure or they're, they're heterostructure. They integrate multiple materials or, or the same materials, but in really intricate hierarchical ways. 
And these become uh, the, these table of contents graphics are also from the special issue, the, the virtual issue on nanosynthetic chemistry, not from my group. But I just, again, want to highlight just some things in the field that point to some really, really cool next level synthetic questions. I mean, I, I think everybody is probably familiar with the, the, the interest in halide perovskite nanocrystals and, and for a whole bunch of different materials, but there are fundamental questions that come up when you think about how do you, how do you connect materials together? How do you integrate them? How do you form interfaces? How do you make structures that have multiple length scales over which there's control? And there's self-assembly methods for doing that, but there's also ways that, that really facilitate kind of these interfaces as are, are clear here, interfaces that are solid, solid interfaces where you can have direct electronic communication. You can have charge migration across interfaces. And so my group has been thinking a lot about those kinds of problems. And I use this, this is a, a beautiful drawing from a few years ago, that's just a great example of, of just something, one, one of many possibilities that, that, that demonstrate where <clears throat> kind of the, the design aspect is and what the synthetic capabilities are and are not. So this is a, a nanoparticle that combine, combines two different semiconductors in a one-dimensional nanorod. It has catalysts at either end, a reduction catalyst, an oxidation catalyst. And so the idea here is, is with the right materials and the right arrangement, this could be a, an overall water splitting catalyst using light. And so I don't wanna focus on the function here and, and get into anything relating to, to that, but I, I wanna dissect this construct, the, this integration of materials, this nanoparticle, and think about what are the design elements what are the components that we really need to think about achieving synthetically in a general sense to have this and other types of multi-component heterostructured nanoparticles to, to form? And so the first part is the materials themselves, the semiconductors, the catalysts, the, the magnets, the you know, optical components in, in other kinds of systems. It's interfaces. It's interfaces that are robust enough to facilitate charge transfer. It's asymmetry. You know, you need in, in this particular construct, you need, you know, directional migration. You need the charge carriers to move away from each other and not recombine. You need the, the different catalysts on different ends. The spatial organization matters. You would need, if you want to maximize kind of what this drawing represents, you need to control the spatial organization and at, a, at a, a very high level. And all that is on top of what we've been focusing on in the, the community for, for decades, right? And that is controlling size, shape, uniformity, crystal structure, composition, surface chemistry, dispersibility, and all those factors that are, have been worked out for things like metal nanocrystals, quantum dots, et cetera, but now superimposed on all of these additional higher level, higher order features. And, and as a, a synthetic chemist, I look at this in a general sense and realize that the goal is pretty you know, it feels insurmountable, right? It's controlling all of those simultaneously, right? To really get the, the level of synthetic control that's needed for high yield, high efficiency type nanoparticles like this. And so there's increasing numbers of ways that, that people around the world, researchers around the world have begun to approach these synthetic problems. And I'm gonna show you just two of the ways that, that my group has uh, approach these and that our, our focus in, in everything I'll talk about in the, the next bit of time is creating interfaces between materials in a single nanoparticle and in a way that's asymmetric. And we do that in, in my group two different ways. One is to create interfaces in asymmetry externally by starting with a seed nanoparticle like platinum and then growing other nanoparticles off of it, a seeded growth type reaction. So this is something we did, oh gosh, almost a decade ago. Time flies, right? So, you know, taking platinum nanoparticles, growing iron oxide off of them. And this is, this is known chemistry. This was around before we, we got into the field as well. So it's well-known well -known reactions for doing this, growing another nanoparticle, growing another nanoparticle. And so the idea that you can start getting back to, to some of the panel questions about relating 
nanoparticle and material synthesis to organic molecules, for example, this is kind of looking more like a total synthesis, looking more like a, a multi-step reaction that increases functionality, increases functional group diversity at each step. And so we, we do a lot of seeded growth reactions where we sequentially grow particles off of a, another particle's surface. But then what I'm going to focus the talk on today is kind of a complementary but distinct approach, and that is building interfaces and asymmetry internally within a, a nanoparticle template. And instead of sequential growth externally, it's sequential modification internally. And for this, we use a, a class of reactions called cation exchange reactions, where we can go in and, and modify systematically and in a controllable way what the inside of the particle looks like. We can install interfaces, we can change composition in controllable and predictable ways. So I want to very briefly introduce cation exchange. So cation exchange has been around for a long time, right? I mean, bulk solids, and, and there are a lot of chemical processes that rely on cation exchange. In the nanoparticle world, it was Paul Alvisados' group that really introduced this to the community as a way of thinking about modifying composition within ubiquitous nanocrystals like quantum dots. And so, you know, there's a, I know this is a very broad audience. I'm not gonna dive in deep on the chemistry. I'm just gonna say, this is very elegant chemistry because the reactions that are happening in the nanoparticles are driven at least in part by interactions in chemistry that's happening in solution. These are all colloidal nanoparticles. They're dispersible in a solvent. And you can basically dial in what reactions you want to happen based on fundamental chemical principles like solvation and coordination and hard soft acid base theory and things like that. But in a, from a very kind of high level, this, this concept and these techniques let you take something like a cadmium selenide quantum dot and kick out the cadmium while replacing it with silver that was initially in solution. So the silver from solution comes into the particle, the cadmium that was in the particle goes into solution. And in the process, the anions stay relatively fixed. We know a lot more about that, you know, in, in the past few years, but you can consider kind of on, on time scales, the anion sublattice is staying pretty, pretty rigid and the, the cations are shuttling in and out at a much faster rate. Once we would have the Elvis Otis group and many others. Once you do a cation exchange reaction, you can kind of cycle it back by just switching the chemistry that's happening in solution, switching what the driving force is, switching what the reagents are. And so it really kind of redefines nanoparticles as reagents. And the idea that you can start, you know, thinking about nanoparticles as chemical reagents that could be modified and transformed into other products, other species. And so my group, what, what you'll see most in this talk uses copper sulfide as our starting material. And, and we'll do a series of either complete or partial cation exchanges. What a complete cation exchange would look like is taking this copper sulfide, which has a, a very unusual formula, Cu1.8S, although we know a little bit more about the chemistry that happens in these reactions. And depending on the system, depending on the chemistry, this actually converts during, actually before the cation exchange reaction into something that's more stoichiometric, like a, a Cu2S type phase. So you can think about it as being more of a Cu2S going to ZnS with a, a two plus cation exchange, kicking out two one plus cations and exchanging them with a single two plus cation. So you can do these complete exchanges. This is work taking copper sulfide and transforming it into zinc sulfide, where you maintain all of the nano features of the, the template nanoparticle, the shape, the size, the uniformity, et cetera. And then you can also do partial cation exchange reactions. So th this is showing work that was really inspirational to us. This is from Richard Robinson's group at Cornell taking you know, the same kinds of copper sulfide particles that we work with, same zinc exchange reaction, but showing that carried out not to completion, you actually get some really interesting features and effects. So in this case, the zinc exchanges kind of at the poles. If you think about this as the globe, right? The, the exchange is happening at the North and South pole at the same time. And the result is you kind of systematically 
you know, introduce zinc sulfide into this copper sulfide sphere. So you're breaking the symmetry and making these sandwich like particles that can, you know, the, the amount of zinc sulfide relative to copper sulfide tracks with the, you know, stage of the reaction, how, how far you, you go into the reaction. So I want to, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more. So I'm a solid state chemist by training. So I and my group get excited about crystal structures. And this is a crystal structure that maybe, you know, where I'm at late at night, it's better to look at this because it, you know, looks blurry and that, you know, it's kind of good to not have to dive into all the details. But from a, a structural perspective, this is what our, our favorite copper sulfide crystal would look like. And we can simplify it. The yellow spheres here are the sulfur anions. That's the part of the structure that remains largely intact. And it's a, it's a pretty complex structure. It's distorted. It, it's got a lot, of, a lot of things going on. But you can simplify it to approximately a hexagonal close-packed anion sublattice. You can, those of you who are familiar with crystal structures, there's an ABAB stacking sequence of the sulfur anions. And so essentially, this is a distorted HCP array of sulfur anions with copper plus cations kind of swimming between the, the, the close packed layers. And the, this is a, a, the copper cations are highly mobile. They can fuse pretty quickly and more think about an ionic conductor. And so it's fairly straightforward to kick out these copper plus cations and replace them with M2 plus or M3 plus cations. And so here's just five examples that we use quite frequently. This is the, the product of a zinc two plus exchange, zinc sulfide exchange with cadmium two plus, get cadmium sulfide, cobalt two plus, get cobalt sulfide. Indium three plus, you actually don't go to completion. There will be a complete structural change, which is a little bit prohibitive. So you end up getting copper indium disulfide gallium exchange with gallium three plus gives you copper gallium sulfide. But one of the things that you can probably notice right away is that this anion sublattice, this ABAB stacking of the close pack planes, that stays constant. So for the most part, not always, but for the most part, when you do these cation exchange reactions, you preserve crystal structure. Not only do you preserve the, the nanoscale aspects, the size and shape and uniformity, but you also preserve kind of the internal atomic level aspects of it, which is the crystal structure. And that's notable because for some of these crystal structures and compounds here, the, these compounds wouldn't normally form this particular crystal structure. This is called wurtzite, the way the, the AB, AB uh, close pack planes are, as well as where the cations are. Normally, many of these would be zinc blend or, or other types of structures. So it allows us to kind of access crystal structures that are unique as well. But I want to I want to get into you know kind of the the heart of what we've been doing in this field for the last few years. And I don't know how many of the people that are listening were listening to the panel discussion a bit ago, but there there were questions about, you know, how how do we think about materials by design and at what what point are we at with respect to being able to you know, just like a, a chemist would have an organic molecule and set out to make, propose a synthesis and carry out a synthesis for a molecule, where are we at? And I, I think one thing to think about is to step back and ask how broad of a scope do we have access to in these reactions? Meaning, do we simply have, you know, something like this where there's one target and one reaction to get to that target, kind of a one at a time approach? Or as computational predictions increase in, in capacity and speed, as combinatorial discovery expands, and as we basically get to a point where we have almost any arbitrary target coming at us, we never know what our target will be, right? It, we, we, we're, we're limited in a sense, or we're becoming limited in our synthetic capabilities. Predictions can, can come almost a lot faster than our ability to go into the lab and make it, in part because a lot of our synthetic methods are not generalizable. We approach them typically one at a time and focus on one thing. So what we set out to do is try to see how broad of a scope 
these reactions could be, how generalizable they are. And a team of students now, PhDs, they've graduated, and Julie is actually a, a new colleague of mine at Penn State. Uh, a, a team of students really tackled this in an amazing way over the last few years. And basically what they started with is to say, okay, let's take this copper sulfide phase that we, we know and love, and let's start by making three different template nanoparticles. These are all known nanostructures, known shapes and, and for these this compound. We'll call them first generation structures, G1. Those will be copper sulfide spheres, so kind of zero dimensional nominally, copper sulfide rods, one dimensional, copper sulfide hexagonal plates, two dimensional. So making all three of those, that, that basically that first generation making these copper sulfide nanoparticles defines the nanoscale features, the size, the shape, uniformity, et cetera. And then they ask the question, what happens with each of these three morphologies systematically as we do partial cation exchange reactions with cadmium 2 plus and zinc 2 plus, increasing reaction time from kind of a, a short period, kind of like what was what, what Richard Robinson's group was doing here, looking at a time progression across all of these different shapes. And so for a zinc two plus exchange on these copper sulfide spheres, indeed we see what, what Richard Robinson's group saw that sandwich type structure emerge. But for cadmium, we see this you know, kind of progression that, that makes more of a Janus, a hemispherical particle. For the rods, for the cadmium, we see kind of a one tip structure where the, the cation exchange, you can almost see the front of it growing as a function of reaction time. For zinc, we again get that sandwich type feature, although at increased time, we also get a central band growing in. So we have access to some unique structures here. I'm not going to talk about the plates, but there's a variety of patchy and marbled structures that emerge. But the key thing I want to point out is at this second generation stage, that's where we've done this first partial cation exchange reaction. The key thing is it's defining interfaces, and you can probably guess that there's different interfaces because of the different ways in which these reactions progress. And so defining these interfaces, we can then take these second generation structures that have interfaces that are defined, but still some remaining copper sulfide. Copper sulfide is the component that's easily exchangeable. And so if you look at kind of this middle row here or this middle column that has kind of the, you know, halfway-ish types of particles, we can then take these second generation structures and we can say, okay, for this one where in the second generation we did a cadmium exchange, let's now do a zinc exchange to get rid of the remaining copper. And we end up with spheres of you know, uh, spheres that look like the copper sulfide we started with, with one half being zinc sulfide, one half being copper sulfide. If we started with the zinc exchange first, we'll go back and do a cadmium exchange next. So we'll make these sandwiches that are zinc sulfide on either end with cadmium sulfide in the middle and so on. So in the end, we have these third generation particles that maintain the morphology and nanoscale features of the first generation the interface is defined at the second generation that have completely different metal sulfide materials in the end. So it's taking something that looks very kind of, you know, typical nanoparticle, right? Single material, certain shapes and sizes. And by applying this single concept, these partial cation exchange reactions with different cations, different reaction times, et cetera, we can end up diversifying these three first generation particles into a library of 47 distinct derivatives. And so that, that starts, you know, this was 2018, you know, it, it's kind of like, oh, whoa, we're, you know, we're, we're used to thinking about one at a time and we've now got 47 in just kind of one unified synthetic platform, which is kind of cool to think about. And there's some other things we're doing in this graphic. We're doing some etching, which is known chemistry. We're just applying the etching and, some interesting ways where we're doing some other things. We're doing some seeded growth as well. And, and so you can start mixing and matching the, the chemistries to get pretty elaborate and complex heterostructured nanoparticles. But being a solid state chemist, I, I want to dive in a little bit more to the crystal structure issue because this becomes really 
a powerful design tool for nanostructure that I, I don't know that that in, in the nano world we're, we're fully harnessing yet. And so if you think about what a spherical nano, well, let, let me let me kind of point this out, right? So with the cadmium exchange, you'll notice that the orientation of the particle here, I had the interfaces being in this direction, vertical, right? And for the zinc sulfide, copper sulfide sandwich particles, I had the interfaces being horizontal. And one could argue that was arbitrary, that was coincidental, but you know, I don't believe in coincidences, right? And so you know, that actually means something that represents something at the crystal structure level. So even though these particles are nominally spherical, which are nominally isotropic, so the surface of a sphere shouldn't have really too much, you know, differentiation, no major faceting, maybe a little bit, but nothing too significant. These are all single domain crystalline particles. So they're single crystals and the crystal structure is not isotropic. The crystal structure has directionality to it because it has these close packed planes that are, are packed and it has the, the cations surrounding them. So what ends up happening, if you think about at the atomic level, what happens when you do a cation exchange reaction starting with copper sulfide and replace some, some, replacing some of the copper one plus cations with let's say cadmium two plus? you end up getting a certain number of cadmium two plus cations in here, which is basically saying you get little regions of cadmium sulfide in a matrix of copper sulfide. The problem with that is cadmium sulfide and copper sulfide are not miscible. They don't want to form kind of a, a solid solution, if you will. They want to remain segregated. They want to remain separate. If they remain segregated, they need to form an interface, right? Because we force them into the same particle but they wanna form an interface. And interfaces are inherently high energy. And so the interfaces that form, you're gonna get the smallest number of interfaces possible typically. You're also gonna get the, the interfaces along the crystallographic directions that are matched best in their spacing. So where the, you know, let's say the sulfur sulfur spacings or the lattice constants are similar. And so that's exactly what happened. So for cadmium sulfide, without going into all the numbers and the details, I'll keep this a little more high level. Cadmium sulfide interfaces best with copper sulfide along this crystallographic direction. As you might guess, zinc sulfide has a smaller lattice constant. Zinc is smaller than cadmium. So if cadmium's happiest here, it's pretty unlikely that zinc also would be happy in the same crystallographic direction. So for zinc sulfide, when you do a cation exchange, it prefers this crystallographic direction to interface with copper sulfide. And so the end result is these, you know, the, the orientations that I'm showing here actually match the crystallographic orientation. So cadmium in a, in a single crystal of copper sulfide that's oriented this way, Cadmium will tend to, to exchange and diffuse in from the side and form an interface this way, where zinc will come this way. And so that becomes really powerful because that lets us start taking, let's say, a spherical object and breaking the symmetry and doing reactions inside the particle that are precise, really precise in their location. So, for example, we know that if we have a sphere of copper sulfide and we do a partial cadmium exchange, the cadmium comes in from a side. We can make a particle that has one half cadmium sulfide, one half copper sulfide. We'll take the copper sulfide side. We know if we do a zinc exchange on copper sulfide, it comes in this way. So we can start with this half, half copper sulfide, cadmium sulfide particle and then come in and do an additional exchange reaction, that sandwich reaction. And we can basically make half a sandwich on one side with a hemisphere of cadmium sulfide on the other for a particle that looks like this. Or if we start with the sandwich particle, we know that cadmium wants to come in from the side. So the residual copper sulfide region will end up getting cadmium coming in from the side and making this type of particle. So these are isomers of one another, if you want to use chemical terms, right? They're the same overall type of, you know, it's the same materials, just organized in a different way. For nanorods, a similar thing happens. You can start with these zinc sulfide, copper sulfide striped rods. They, they do the same kind of thing in terms of caps this direction. 
and then cadmium sulfide comes in from the side. Or we can start with the cadmium sulfide tip. We can install through cation exchange zinc sulfide stripes and then bring in another you know, cadmium sulfide notch in that direction. So you can start seeing where this is leading, right? I would say two things. One is just the, the ability to start rationally designing how materials are interfacing and integrating into a single particle and the, the level to which these this internal modification can really control asymmetry, interfaces, locations, all of that. The other thing is, is making this analogy to the synthesis of, of molecules. These reactions are regioselective. They're, they're targeted to certain regions of the nanoparticle that are driven by crystallographic relationships. So essentially, this is crystallographic regioselectivity. It's using crystal structure to define the precise locations within the nanoparticle where the cation exchange reactions are happening. So I want to dive in a little deeper on the nanorods because once we started getting results like this, you know, we started saying, what all is really possible, right? Because before we were taking spheres and rods and plates, and we were, you know, we, we took those three morphologies and got 47 derivatives. How much really is possible in, in terms of diversifying scope? and being able to access the largest number of nanostructures possible. And so I'm, we, we focused on the rods here. And the, the setup, you know, obviously this is a simplified version, but this is benchtop chemistry. This is fairly straightforward, you know, flask and on a schlank line, you know, but it's, it's basically just standard solvents that you would use for nanocrystal synthesis. And we start by injecting in the copper sulfide nanorods. And then you basically take, you know, let, let's take these five metals that I showed earlier, right? When I showed the crystal structure of copper sulfide and I had the five products that we, we make pretty often, let's take those five cations, zinc two plus, indium three plus, gallium three plus, cobalt two plus, and cadmium two plus. And we can sequentially inject substoichiometric amounts of those. What I mean is we use a specific volume and concentration of a zinc two plus exchange solution to just exchange, let's say something like one sixth of the copper cations in the copper sulfide rod. So what happens is you just get a part of the rod that exchanges. So it's the effect of introducing a zinc sulfide tip on an otherwise copper sulfide rod. When you do that though, th these rods are also single crystalline. But when you do that reaction, you end up getting a region between the, the copper sulfide that remains and whatever the, the most recent material that was exchanged in. It, it's, it's got lower crystallinity in this region. And so there, there's this interfacial region that, that effectively facilitates the next exchange reaction, or at least ends up contributing to where the, the next segment will go. And so all of that said, the order in which you choose to inject your exchange solutions becomes the order in which they exchange sequentially in the rod. So our next exchange step is indium that forms a band of copper indium sulfide below the zinc sulfide. Next exchange is gallium that installs a segment of copper gallium sulfide. Next is cobalt that installs a segment of cobalt sulfide. The next is cadmium. Remember cadmium sulfide is the one that's bigger than, than typically all of the others. So cadmium sulfide wants to have an interface that's this direction. So we get these, these segments that are horizontal interfaces, zinc sulfide, copper indium sulfide, copper gallium sulfide, cobalt sulfide, and then a cadmium sulfide notch on the side. So all of this is, is rational and predictable in the sense of we're choosing the order based on the injection sequence, and we're defining the, the orientation of the interfaces based on those crystal structure relationships. And so one reaction ends up forming a sixth generation rod that's zinc sulfide, copper indium sulfide, copper gallium sulfide, cobalt sulfide with a cadmium sulfide, copper sulfide 
you know, kind of dimer segment at the bottom. This is an absurdly complex nanoparticle that even a couple of years ago, we wouldn't have even dreamt that you could make. The idea that you can integrate these types of materials that precisely into a nanoparticle was, was beyond what we were expecting. And, and I will note that I, I'm showing just single particles here, but these are uniform particles and the yield is, is, is pretty high. These are isolatable in bulk quantities and, and the, the, the particle to particle variation is quite low overall. So, so this is where, you know, now that, that we had a system like this, we were really interested in saying, okay, what all is possible here? What can we really do to, to diversify scope? And so we focused in on the zinc sulfide system. And so starting with the copper sulfide rods, the first generation, we actually figured out, we didn't, <laughs> Ben was really, really good at this and figured out how to install uh, a tip of zinc sulfide, a central band of zinc sulfide and double tip of zinc sulfide. So we could make these three in reasonably high yield. We also you know, realized we could make samples that contained all three of them so that we could microscopically sample without making quite so many samples. The long story short, these three are, are the starting materials now that we're gonna you know, see what all is possible. So in this first exchange step, we use zinc two plus. We have five total cations. We'll, We'll, we'll eliminate zinc two plus from the next set, and we've got four other cations. So we'll take this zinc sulfide, copper sulfide tipped rod, and we'll exchange it with, you know, each of these four remaining cations. That will produce a segment at this pre-existing interface. So we'll get, you know, copper and sulfide here, copper gallium sulfide here, cobalt sulfide here, cadmium sulfide here. Same thing here, except because there's a central band, there's two interfaces. So the subsequent exchange reactions kind of step outward. Here there's two interfaces, but the exchange, subsequent exchanges step inward. Long story short, from these three nanorods with zinc sulfide, we can make 12 derivatives. And so, you know, you can probably guess where I'm going at this part. There's residual copper sulfide in all of these, so we can keep going. We can keep doing more partial exchange reactions to progressively exchange more and more of the copper sulfide. So these three times four is 12. Each of these 12 can undergo four subsequent exchange reactions. 12 times four is 48 for fourth generation. Each of these fourth generation, 48 of them can undergo you know, four subsequent exchanges. 48 times 4 is 192, times 4 is 768, times 4 is 3072, times 4 is 12,288. So what this kind of, you know, slightly overwhelming graphic represents are synthetically feasible pathways to 12,288 possible heterostructured metal sulfide nanorods, all starting with just these three templates that themselves derive from just a single type of copper sulfide rod. And what I'm showing here, obviously, you can tell what are cartoons. These are our actual data, the STEM EDS element maps for the ones that we observed experimentally. And then these down here show the total synthesis. So for this one here, you know, each of these exchanges is a separate step and it shows what the you know, process was that we took to make it. And I, I would argue this is probably one of the, the most complex nanoparticles in terms of the, the, the scope and, and number of materials and interfaces. I think it's something like six materials and eight segments and 11 internal interfaces or something. And these are all as uniform 20 by 50 nanometer colloidal nanorods. And so this graphic that I had on the last slide, I was showing three second generation particles that we were starting with that had these three variants of zinc sulfide, copper sulfide. It turns out that we can make nine other, yeah, nine, I can count. It's, it's not too late yet. So we can make nine other variants in reasonably high yield with, with high confidence. And so if you, if you go back to this, basically each arm 
just starting with one of these gives us 5,460 possible derivatives. So each new structure that we can make up at this level adds another 5,460 to the number of possibilities. And so we can in total at this point make 12 variations in reasonably high yield that we're confident in, which effectively lets us propose synthetically feasible pathways to any one of 65,520 distinct heterostructured nanorods. So what that really does in terms of some of the original questions I posed, if, if a computational prediction were to come up with any of these, we have a pathway to make it. And it's predictable based on the simple relationships of what order you inject and what the interfaces, what the crystallographic relationships would be. So it really merges in terms of getting into the tens of thousands of possibilities. It merges the scope of combinatorial synthesis with what you can make rationally in a lab in a way that's scalable with high yield. And just to show what, it, what is possible, you know, this, this gives an idea of the particle to particle uniformity. I always like to point out mistakes, right? There's a few that over exchange, but for the most part, you know, these are, are pretty uniform particle to particle in terms of, of what they look like. There's also the possibility of mix and match configurability. So these six are all various isomers of zinc sulfide, copper neum sulfide, cobalt sulfide, and copper sulfide, depending on what you start with, what the order of reactions are. And then this just gives you a flavor of some other crazy types of particles that, that one can start making as well. And so taking this even a step farther, you, you can start applying these, these design guidelines retrosynthetically, you can start designing precise features. And so this is work that Austin Butterfield, who just graduated, did to, to really kind of show like, what, what, what can you make that pushes the limits of complexity? And so this shows, again, more of a total synthesis for making these from a nanoparticle perspective, these are Janus nanoparticles, but one side, this is cadmium sulfide, zinc sulfide, one side having a faceted tip, the other having a flat tip. So that level of control, both compositional asymmetry as well as faceting asymmetry. Another one is tuning the exchange length and combining that with being able to etch out the copper sulfide, which is a known reaction to control the, the length of cadmium sulfide protrusions that emerge from an otherwise zinc sulfide particle, either kind of these more flat protrusions or ones that are more pointy based on kind of how the, the interfaces want to be at, based on cadmium sulfide and the crystallographic relationships, or taking it a step further, being able to control gap sizes through engineering in the, the width of, of you know, how far the zinc sulfide is exchanged from the end to control how much space is in the gap, installing a cadmium sulfide notch on it, and then removing the copper sulfide. So this is starting to feel a lot like how you might approach a, a molecule synthesis through these you know, multi-step reactions. And, and just as the, the final thing to kind of show like, like where even, even more... I would say excitement can come from the exact same reaction that formed this fifth generation nanoparticle where we started with a, a nanorod of copper sulfide, installed a zinc sulfide tip, then copper neum sulfide, copper gallium sulfide, cobalt sulfide. The same reaction carried out sequentially with sequential injections. When you do that same reaction, with a simultaneous injection, meaning all cations are present together in solution applied to spheres, they end up forming a high entropy metal sulfide. They end up forming a solid solution. They don't segregate, they all intermix. And so that's another kind of cool thing that comes out from design space, being able to tune between solid solutions and heterostructuring based on the morphology and the way that the exchange is done, whether it's sequential or whether it's all together in one. So I, I have a lot of words here. I don't, I don't really need to, <laughs> to read all of them, but, but suffice it to say that what we're, what we're really trying to do in, in the main work that I talked about here is really leverage 
cation exchange, nanoparticle cation exchange is a fairly simple and straightforward approach to engineering extreme complexity into nanoparticles, being able to, to put multiple materials into otherwise uniform colloidal nanoparticles in a way that is, is well, frankly, was unimaginable to us and probably others as well years ago, but now is just routine. Simple benchtop chemistry, standard laboratory glassware, it's a kind of a point where it's mix and match. There are a lot of challenges ahead, right? Like, you know, we're, we're working only on a small number of nanoparticles. There's obvious or a small number of materials. There's obviously additional chemical challenges that come from trying to expand this and then actually applying it in a total synthesis way to targets of interest. So there's a lot more that that will surely come from this. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there and I'm happy to take a few questions and thanks again for the opportunity to, to speak. Okay, uh, thank you for sharing your wonderful work. Actually, I have uh, one question. Uh, you have uh, mainly showed that the uh, cation exchange of sulfide, so is there any Dependence of you know calcogen element, for example, zinc selenide or zinc tellurite. Is there yeah. right? Yes, yes, of course. So there, so we're we're starting to work on other calcogenides, but others others in the community are as well. There are papers out there already on making interfaces through partial cation exchange on metal selenides, metal tellurides, etc. I think there's a lot of open questions, of course, but but yeah, the the chemistry is there for uh -huh. that. So is, is there, do you have any expectation in terms, for example, in terms of kinetics or thermodynamics, you know, based on the theories, like the, the, different, the, the differences between sulfide and selenide? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. So, so we and others, I think, have really focused on sulfides the most. And I think what I've seen in the literature and, and what I've seen kind of from personal experience is there's a lot we don't know moving into the selenides and tellurides. So I would say the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> Even though you asked, is it this or this, right? Because I these are, these are, I mean, obviously I'm presenting it in the most simple way possible, but these reactions are more complex than I'm letting on, right? There's a lot of components, both in solution and in the nanoparticle and with the ligands that are on the surface and dynamics and diffusion rates. And so there are kinetic considerations, there's thermodynamic considerations and they're intertwined. Okay. And so it, it's, it's, there's a lot more to learn, you know, talking about frontiers and, and stuff, right? There's a lot more to dive into with these systems for sure. Okay, thank you for your answer. Now, uh, let me uh, lead you. Let me lead the the question from the the participant. Okay, the first first question is that the sixth generation nanorod structure seems to be applicated into nano sized transistors or more complicated nano electronics. Uh, there have been studies related to BJT or other applications. Uh, I, I would say that's a frontier area. I mean, you know, I, I've talked to some folks that are interested in trying to choose materials and semiconductors and metals and insulators and putting them together in a certain way. I, I think most of the particles that have been made through partial cation exchange have been targeted more for things like photocatalysis and, and some other more photonic and catalytic applications, but uh, there's there's a lot that can be done for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for your answer. Uh, the next question is pretty long. <laughs> <laughs> From your slide on multi-strip load, I can see that the load length is decreasing ever so, so slightly for every generation of cation exchange. Does this shrinkage occur over the whole population? And if so, does the slightly material loss or com compression? On a related note, it, it would be interesting to consider the internal strain present in this multi-component nanorods and how this affects their surface chemistry reactivity. If you have an, 
if you haven't already, okay? <laughs> Could you answer? Yeah. Question? Yeah, no, it's a, it's an excellent question. There's a lot of rich chemistry in in that. So I, I think, I mean, a couple of things I would mention that are are pretty well known during the reaction, like I, I mentioned toward the end that you can etch out the copper sulfide. And the chemistry to etch out the copper sulfide can also happen in situ during the cation exchange if the reaction isn't perfect. <laughs> I'll just put it that way, right? Because if if the reaction isn't set up perfectly, a little bit of contamination or air exposure or something like that can do that. So some of the shrinkage can indeed be material loss. Some can be compression because the you're starting with one you know, material with a certain crystal structure and lattice constant, and some of them are smaller. So, you know, propagated over the entire length of the nanorod, most certainly, you know, compression or expansion potentially, but mostly compression could be viable. Mm -hmm. And then the strain, I actually had a slide prepared, but I, I hit it because of time, but we, we've done work. We, we published a paper earlier this year showing, you know, you, some of these cation exchange reactions can actually introduce a high density of stacking faults that inherently are high strain regions or, or have high strain regions in them. And so that likely plays a role as well. So that, that again, I think points to, there is a lot more going on in these reactions and in the products than, than maybe initially, you know, expected. So all the, all those things that were mentioned are certainly viable and definitely excellent Excellent questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the, the last question is that, thank you for interesting talk. Is it possible to synthesize multi-element nanoparticles in oxide or similar system with the, this method? Yeah, so moving to other systems. So I already touched on selenides and tellurides, right? That, that's known. There is cation exchange that's been done on oxides. There's cation exchange that's been done on halides. Right. I, I think and, and phosphides and, and it's it's you know fairly broad, but again, I think you know, in the end, those are all distinct material systems. Exchange rates are going to be different, interfaces are going to be different, the inherent chemistry and in driving it and the activation energies to driving it and diffusion lengths and all that. There's going to be a lot of differences as well. And so the, the short answer is yes, there there is much more kind of material space beyond. The sulfides, but it that's frontier research, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for your answer and thank you for your wonderful talk. And now uh, uh, let's thanks to Professor Shaq again. Thank you.